how do narcissists test their victims? Why do they test them at all? Number one, they test them because they want to make sure that you are for them. Because in a narcissist world, in, in their weird world of turmoil and, and the vortex of craziness, you're either for them or you're against them. If you are not for them, then you are the enemy. You become public enemy number one. So they're constantly checking, checking, checking to make sure that you are for them. And so you're constantly having to try to prove it, prove it, prove it all the time. And they test you in many different ways. So the reason why they do this is because they need an endless amount of what we call supply. They basically want to make sure that you are going to be there to serve what it, the whole purpose is of you being around to begin with, which is to feed their need for narcissistic supply. So narcissistic supply is anything that feeds their ego, which is you know, compliments, adulation, uh, respect, all of those things, of course. And if you don't give them those things in the form of good supply, then they'll take it. Well, they'll take it anyway in the form of what we call bad supply, which is devaluing and debasing and, and making you feel bad, judging you, putting you down, uh, little passive aggressive things to make, make it known to you that you have very little worth to them. And sometimes it's little tiny things, you know, that, that just kind of drip, drip, drip on your head where they just, it's, it's seriously death by a thousand cuts or making you crazy by just doing these little things all the time. But when they're testing you, they are just making sure that you're going to stick around no matter what, even if they treat you poorly. They want to know, are you for me or against me? So they'll um, mistreat you. They'll put you down. They'll call you names. They'll give you the silent treatment. That's one of their biggest, by the way, is silent treatment. It's all a method of getting you back under their web of control. Because remember, the narcissistic relationship is love bomb to value discard. And if you want to know more about the narcissistic relationship, check out my videos on love bombing, devaluing, and discarding. And I, I go much more deeply into what a narcissistic relationship looks like. It always starts with love bomb. It always ends with discard. And I had somebody tell me it's toxic stew in between, which is definitely true. But what happens is as they're devaluing you, they can often be love bombing you. And this is all a way to keep you under their web of control. So they will be saying things to test you, you know, by devaluing you, by causing you pain, which they, they don't have the ability to feel your pain, but they're going to be doing these things just to see if you're going to stick around. So silent treatment is one big one. They will just simply, you know, um, stop talking to you because they want you to come back to them. Please talk to me. Please uh, forgive me. I am so sorry for whatever I did so that they can come back to you and, and they'll say, okay, fine. Um, they might just have a tantrum, have a full on meltdown because of the way you acted because they want to see, are you going to stick around? Are you going to leave? Or are you going to be for me? Or are you going to be against me? They might even use hoovering or, or coming back, you know, even in the discard phase, they come back. And I see that often in divorces. What happens is in a divorce situation, you know, they can be acting heinous in a divorce, gaslighting you, using everything against you, using the court system against you, threatening to take your children away, threatening to that you're going to pay lots of alimony, threatening that you're not going to get any if that's what you want. You know, threat, 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 threat all over the place, lying, lying in pleadings, lying in motions, lying to lawyers, lying to the mediator, you know, manipulating evidence, all this kinds of stuff 
is going on. And then right in the middle of that, they say, you know, they'll send you an email. Oh, you know, why are we doing this? You know, you know that we can just get along. You know how um, it's, this isn't so good for the kids. Why are we spending this money, you know, and trying to grab you back in? Again, testing you, testing to see if they still have power over you, if they still have the ability to control you. For you guys who've been tested before and you think that you've been tested by a narcissist, give me a yup in the comments. Another way that narcissists test their victims is on the phone. Like, so let's say you're having a telephone conversation with them. And while you're having the conversation, you feel like, okay, we've talked about what we needed to talk about. So now I want to hang up the phone. They'll say, oh, why do you want to hang up first? Don't you want to talk to me anymore? And you know, they don't want you that that's like a form of rejection for them. Another one that's related to that is you walking away. So you're in the middle of a fight, even if they've walked away a hundred thousand times and didn't listen to you, they'll do the same thing back to you. Walk away so that, you know, you're the one groveling after them saying, please don't walk away. We can work this out. Come on back. Let's talk. And they're just testing you to see if you're going to go back after them. They're testing you to see if you are going to show them the respect that they want. And that's another way that they test you, by the way, is they'll constantly say things like, you don't respect me. You don't love me. You don't um, give me the time that I want. You're, you're always giving time to everybody else, but you're not giving time back to me. Uh, how come you're putting everybody else first? Those are all types of phrases to test you, to see what you're going to say. Are you going to say, oh, no, no, you're first. Oh, no, I'm so sorry that I put uh, somebody else in front of you. Of course, you mean the most to me. Yes, I love you. Of course, I love you. Here's all the ways that I love you. So, you know, making sure that you're still there, you're still the one. I mean, they might even make you do something for them just to see if you're going to do it because they're testing you. They want to make sure that you're for them. They have to constantly have reassurance that you're for them. So the truth is they're testing you from the beginning of the relationship. A lot of times what you see with narcissists is they move in super quickly. You know, the, the relationship is super fast tracked in the love bomb stage. So, you know, let's meet your kids right away. I want to move if you have children from a previous relationship, or I want to move right into your home right away. And, and, and they're testing to see if you are the right type of supply for them by how you respond to that. Because, you know, do you let them move in right away? Do you say, I love you right away? Do you immediately agree that you're supposed to be soulmates? And yes, you're meant to be together. And how crazy is it that you just met and you're soulmates and you're meant to be together? You know, that kind of thing. So the bottom line is that narcissists are testing you from the minute you walk into their lives until the minute that you go no contact and, and actually stop talking to them because they always want to know, can you be a form of supply for them? And if you're not, then you are the enemy and they're going to go after you, smear you, try to take you down as much as possible. All right. So let's talk about how narcissists test their victims, their new targets. This is really, really important because what's happening is they are actually conditioning you so that they're destabilizing you. They're weakening you. And then when you go to negotiate with them, you've already been conditioned. And then when you go to negotiate with them, you, you actually now have to recondition them. And that's why you're kind of like nervous about negotiating with them. Cause you know, you kind of actually realize on a subconscious level that you've been conditioned, you know, that if you try to fight back, that they're going to kind of rage against you because they've conditioned you to a place where if you try to do anything that 
they're going to act a certain way. And how this all started was when they in, in this testing phase. And that's why this testing phase is really, really an important phase. And how do they do that? It's kind of on a micro level, but it starts off right off the bat during this love bombing phase. They target people who are strong. They're targeting people who have lots of great qualities. They want people who have lots of value. And I say it all the time. They're not looking for people who have no value. They didn't target you because you have so little value. They target you because you have so much value. They want supply. So they they love people who are strong, who have great connections, who are beautiful people, who have great personalities, who have lots of value in the world, who are maybe have lots of prestige, who are successful. They want that. They want what you have. I mean, a lot of times they want to kind of suck it from you almost like a pod or something. But then once they get you into their world, then they want to kind of take over you. So that's when they start to manipulate you. They want to start to devalue you. And then they test to see how you behave when they do that. So they'll start doing things like giving you the silent treatment or ghosting you. And then they they see how do you behave when they do that? Did you allow it or lying to you? And how did you behave when that happened? Did you let it go? Didn't uh, take responsibility for something that, that they should have? Did you let it go? Did they give you an explanation for something that didn't really add up? Did they project, deflect? Did they lie? And you said, uh, okay, did you buy it? Were they able to charm you? Were they able to charm you into believing it? Were they able to love bomb you back into their web? Were were they able to get you to forget about it and be back on track? Did they have a tantrum? And you, you, you stepped back and you went, okay, never mind. How did you behave with that? Did you stay with them through that? If they started interrogating you, how did you behave through that? If they started playing the victim, how did you behave? I have a whole video, by the way, on, you know, if you catch a narcissist in a lie, what happens, which you should definitely check out. But, you know, it's like the whole lying and denying and deflection and projection and the whole thing. How did you behave with that? You know, because the more that they get away with, the more that they realize that they can kind of pull you back, push on you, pull you back, push on you, pull you back, push on you. They're conditioning you. And by the way, there's this whole study that was done by a psychologist named, I think it was a psychologist named Robert Sapolsky. And he was out of Stanford University many, many years ago. And he did a study on monkeys where he gave a a monkey a treat every single time they did something good and nothing happened in their brain. He was studying what happened with the chemicals in their brain. And then when they did something great, you know, he only gave them the reward intermittently. And then he studied what happened in their brain, the dopamine levels in their brain were released that feel good hormone in their brain actually rose to the level of cocaine. Like it felt so good to them, just the anticipation that they would be receiving this reward, not the actual reward itself, not that the fact that they were going to get the reward just the anticipation that they were going to get the reward, these dopamine levels would release. And so that's what happens with people who are in relationship with narcissists. 
they get this anticipation that they're going to get this reward of this love bomb because they come on so strong, so charming, so amazing. And so they're able to charm you. And so they're conditioning. Are you going to forget about it? Oh, let the past be the past. We're going to go forward. Do you go along with that? Do you believe in, in that? You know, do, do you let the future faking wash over you? Do you go along with the future faking? Do you buy into it? You know, so that's what they're doing. That's, that's the testing process. That's the conditioning. It's very, very, very sick. And it's, it's very highly manipulative, but that's what they're doing. That's how they test you. And that, that's what's going on when they are testing you. And if you've seen this, I want to see you put, I've seen this in the comments right now, because I bet you guys have seen this. I bet you guys have experienced this. You know, they are conditioning you. And so what happens now in the negotiation phase is you guys have to condition them back. You guys have to start making these micro steps that other direction. And that's how you start shifting the dynamic because you're going to start to march forward in a different direction and you're going to start to turn the tables. Are you dealing with a covert narcissist? Covert narcissists are the absolute worst. I have dealt with them myself in my personal life. And that is why I am on this mission, on this crusade to help you guys break free from them too. Because I know they, they get stuck in your head. They literally know how to get stuck in the recesses of your head, you become obsessed. Seriously, like you wake up in the middle of the night, you're thinking about it. You wake up in the morning, you're thinking about it. You're brushing your teeth, you're thinking about it. You seriously cannot get away from these. It's seriously like death by a thousand cuts because they are so subtle. I've recently heard this term micro manipulation. And I love this term because this is what they do. I mean, it is so subtle that when you go to try to tell somebody about it, people think, well, that doesn't sound that bad. And there's this term called plausible deniability, and that is what they do. I mean, it's so subtle that it's really, really hard to describe what it is that they're doing that doesn't, it just doesn't seem that bad because these micro manipulations are so tiny. They're literally messing with your mind a little at a time. You know, there's this old term Chinese water torture, which, you know, I kind of don't love that term because I'm half Chinese and, you know, it's not the greatest, but it's that little like drip, drip, drip on your forehead where it's just a little at a time. It's the whole death by a thousand cuts thing. And so this is how covert narcissists literally make you crazy and drive you absolutely insane. So these micro manipulations are what they do to absolutely drive you crazy. It is a subtle form of emotional abuse that they use in their closest relationships to gain a sense of control and especially regain a sense of control if they think they're losing it. So one of the things that they will do, for example, is, you know, they'll send like a DM. It has like the shock value, like, oh, I had a biopsy today and I don't know what the outcome is going to be. And then they'll like unsend it. Oh, that wasn't meant for you. Something like that. And you'll be like, what, what, what was that? And you know, this massive drama bomb and you'll go, what was that? And then they'll say, oh, sorry, that wasn't meant for you. That was for somebody else. It was so that you will go, what, what was that? What was that? Play on your sympathy so that you'll come back and, and want to know what, what that was and get, you know, to get your attention. And then they'll be super secretive about it. Oh, that wasn't meant for you. Sorry. I know you don't care anymore to try to reawaken your empathy to see if you still care, try to get you to worry, you know, something to that effect. So that may be one of the things that they might do. Another thing that they might do is 
try to get you to participate in activities that they know that you don't necessarily enjoy. This is if you're still in a relationship with them. So they will do that, but you know, they'll make you do that, but they know that you will go along and you won't say anything because they know that you're the type of person that will go along to get along. And they might say, oh, it's just for a minute and it won't take that long and you'll be fine with it. And then after a while, it ends up being like your whole day or something like that. And an hour turns into three hours and it turns into the whole day or something. And you just end up being, you know, annoyed or whatever. And, but you just ended up kind of getting roped into the whole thing. And what can you really end up doing about it? But they end up just sort of roping you into that whole thing. So then it makes them sort of feel like, well, they got their way, but what can you really do? Well, they say, oh, it uh, it wasn't supposed to be that or whatever. And you end up being the bad person if you say anything about it. So that's another example. Another example would be where they say something to you or do something for you that is supposed to be nice for you that ends up not being so nice. One of the things that somebody close to me, for example, you know, it was a family member that my husband and I had in our, in our family, and they would do something nice for you. And then as they're doing something nice for you, they would be saying something like, oh, you're going to get so spoiled because I'm doing this nice thing for you. And so, you know, you kind of get the sense like there's like this, these strings attached to them doing something nice for you, you know? So there's like this sort of manipulation around it, these strings attached to it. Or they might give like a backhanded compliment, like you're losing so much weight. I mean, you have a ways to go, but you really look so much better than you used to, you know, something like that. Another thing that they might do is sort of bad mouth people around you. Like your friends are so great, but don't really love this person. You know, why, why do you hang around people that are so not worthy of you, something like that. You know, you, you really could hang around better people, make it seem like your friends aren't the greatest or something like that. And it's talking negatively about people in your life all the time and trying to just isolate you from your friends that sort of thing. Another thing that they will do is kind of subtly never accept your opinions on something. You know, they'll always sort of put you down. Well, you know, that sounds like a good idea, but why would we do that? Or how about if we do it this way instead? And and you just sort of start to realize that anytime you have given your idea or your opinion on something, they never take your idea or opinion on something. They just always sort of put it down or they'll always sort of discount it. And you're always realizing that they always go with their idea or their opinion. And it's just always these little kinds of things. It's a micro manipulation, just these little tiny things. They're just tiny things. Like if you cleaned a room, for example, they say, yeah, you did a good job with it. But as they're kind of going behind you and continuing to fix it up or to continuing to clean it, to let you know, you didn't really quite do a great job, that sort of thing. So those are the kinds of things that you see. I mean, if you want to know more about covert narcissism in relationships, I have a whole video on that. After a while, it just 
erodes away at your self-esteem, at who you are, and you just lose the sense of yourself. Okay. So maybe you've been in a relationship with a narcissist before, and you want to make sure that you don't want to ever have that happen ever again. And so let's use this simple test to make sure that that never happens to you. And by the way, this was actually one of the ideas that somebody had written into me and asked me, Hey, can you do a video on this topic? Okay. So let's just dive right in on, on this. Okay. So you are now dating and you want to know if this person in your life is a narcissist. And here's what I'm going to tell you. It's actually pretty simple. I mean, there's really only one thing that you need to figure out on this. Okay. It's, it's actually not that hard because I know how it feels when I'm around a person who is making me feel good or a person who's not. The truth of the matter is when I was dealing with a narcissistic person in my life, I had to deal with one who was a business partner. Initially, the person was like great and fun to be around and all of that. But then it just started to feel like every time I was around that person and I would come away from being with that person, I just kind of had a bit of a pit in my stomach. I, you know, I just didn't really feel all that great. But when I'm with people who are amazing in my life, like my best friends, my best girlfriends, I feel happy. I feel supported. I feel uplifted. I feel nourished. And so I'm going to ask you, when you are around people who, who are really, really making you feel amazing, you know, when you walk away from them, you feel like you want to take on the world. There's a quote from Rumi. It's like one of my favorite quotes. And I think about it all the time. And it says, seek those who fan your flames. It starts off with set your life on fire seek those who fan your flames. And I, I almost feel like it should be reversed. Like once you seek those who fan your flames, you feel like you want to set your life on fire, right? Because when you're around those who fan your flames, like those people are like saying, Hey, can I throw logs on your fire? Can I, can I help you build your fire? And the people who aren't putting logs on your fire, you're feeling like they're like, they're actually throwing water on your fire half the time, right? And those are the people that you almost don't want to tell them when something good is happening in your life. If you feel like that, if you feel like something great happened to you and you don't want to share it with that person because you think that they're not going to be happy for you, or you think that they're going to be jealous of you, or you think that they're going to like say, have some nasty comment, then that's not a person who's fanning your flames. And, and that might want to tell you something. If you come away from being with a person and you feel like depleted and you feel like they're sucking your soul, that's something to tell you, you know? I mean, if you're in a relationship, let me ask you, do you feel heard? Do you feel valued? Or do you feel like this person is choking you? You know, your soul knows. Back when I was practicing law and, and I was certainly practicing, you know, I was practicing divorce law and people would say to me, you know, should I stay with this person? What do you think? And I, I would always say, hey, I'm not here to make those decisions for you. I used to say, I'm here to facilitate if you're, if you're ready to go. I mean, unless they were in a, an abusive situation, you know, but, and I would just say, but your soul knows, right? How do you feel when you're with this person? Is this person taking a genuine interest in you? I have a cousin. He's just one of the most genuine, authentic people on the planet. And he's just one of those people that you just, you can't wait to see and you can't wait to be around because, you know, even if it's been like three or four years, five years since you've seen him last time, and you, maybe you only met him once or twice. The next time you see him, maybe you, you were talking about a business endeavor or something, you know, you're a yoga 
something that you were going to start. The next time he sees you, he's going to sit down with you and he's going to say, hey, now the last time we talked, you were going to be starting yoga retreats. How did that go for you? How did that end up working out? He genuinely takes an interest in you as an individual and sees you for who you are. Every single person is important and an amazing, incredible individual. That's how, you know, you want to be seen in the eyes of the person that you're with. And if you are not with a person like that, if that person is constantly shifting the subject back to them, not interested in you, not caring about you as a, a, as a human being, you know how you feel. And if that's how you feel when you're with that person, then, you know, you know. And by the way, if you are in a relationship with a narcissist and you don't feel seen, heard, and valued, and you are feeling like your soul is being sucked and you do feel like you need to do some self-care. I do have a video on self-care to cope with narcissists. You may want to check that out. You don't want to continue in a relationship when you're you're with somebody who's like that. And, and, you know, obviously there may be some trauma bonding going on. I do understand that there is some of that sometimes and you do need to do what you need to do to maybe get some therapy or get some help or do what you need to do to be prepared. And obviously I have a whole lot of videos and all kinds of things that you need to do to take care of yourself and take care of your finances and take care of all the things that you need to do. That's not the purpose of this particular video, but the simple test on figuring out if someone you love, or if you're in a relationship with someone who's with a narcissist is how are you feeling when you're with this person? And, and by the way, you know, is this person trying to separate you from people that you love or are they including people that you love? You know, narcissists, they're trying to get you away from people that you love because they're trying to control you. Is that happening? Are they trying to control who you're talking to, what you're wearing, or are they allowing you to be who you are? Are they, you know, allowing you to express yourself? That's the simple test. How do you feel? What's your gut telling you? Your soul always knows. I love the book, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sing, because the caged bird is really your soul. Your soul will sing no matter what. You know, I want you to to know that you can take care of yourself and that you should take care of yourself. And I want you to put down in the comments, I will take care of myself because you should take care of yourself and put your, your self care first. And, and don't ignore the red flags. Do not ignore those red flags. In the end of, at the end of the day, ignoring them will not help. You know, it only gets worse does not get better. They do not change, by the way, as much as they say that they will or they, they want to. And, I, you know, a lot of times I think they do want to because, you know, narcissists at the end of the day, they're not, they're not happy people. But sitting around and hoping and wishing and praying that they're going to change is not going to make them change. So, yeah, I mean, they just, it's a sinking ship and they're just going to take you down with them. And you're just going to end up feeling like you're drowning too. So if you are in a situation like that, the best thing for you to, is to get out of that situation. All right. So you are getting ready to deal with a narcissist and, you know, you're in the middle of drama, trauma, and chaos for sure. And you can't even think straight half the time because you're under siege. That's what happens when you go into the discard phase of a narcissistic relationship. Remember there's the love bombing, then there's the devaluing, then there's the discarding. And if you want to know more about those three phases, definitely check out my videos on each one of those topics. But when you're in that discard phase, that's when you start to see the birth of the smear campaign and all these things are coming at you at once. And when you are uh, in that phase, the narcissist basically wants to take you down. They want to get you before you get them. 
So you're going to start to see them doing things. They're going to start lining up their flying monkeys. They're going to, you know, meaning these third parties, what flying monkeys are, it was a reference to the wiz uh, Wizard of Oz. And the Wicked Witch had her flying monkeys and these people who just sort of like sat on the side of the evil person and just kind of went along and didn't really realize what was going on. And that's what flying monkeys actually really are. I mean, they're people that the narcissist has lined up to um, be on their side or against you. And in their perfect world, both, right? On their side and against you, which is perfect for them. And they want you to feel like you are ganged up on. They want you to feel like you are isolated, that you are out of it, that, that you're excluded, that you, there's nothing more for you because um, they want you to be suffering. I've actually had somebody who said, uh, you know, I think that he wants me to kill myself. That's not the case, actually, because if you did that, then they wouldn't have any more narcissistic supply. What they really want is to just make you miserable. They get off on that. It's totally sick. I mean, that's, but that's what it is for them. They actually kind of get a high out of making people miserable. And that's why they drag out litigation. That's why the negotiation process takes so long. You know, I have a private Facebook group, which by the way, you are certainly welcome to join. It's called Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung. And I did a survey in there and asked people, how long did your litigation take? How much did it cost you? And do you know that a huge percentage of people said it cost more than a hundred thousand dollars and it cost more and it took more than three years? Why do you think that is? because you are dealing with a narcissist in negotiation at that point. And what's driving them? It's not to come to a nice resolution. It's not even to win. No, newsflash for you. A narcissist is not in it just to win. They, they are in it to make you miserable, to devalue you, to squash you, to hurt you, to hurt you before you hurt them, to make sure that Everybody knows that whatever happened with the relationship was your fault and that they're the perfect ones and that you're the villain. They might even call you the narcissist. You never know, but that's what's going on. So when you are in this entire process of negotiation, what are some signs of malicious intent? One of the very first big, huge honking red, you know, arrows should be that they constantly move the goalposts. And why do they constantly move goalposts? Well, if you want to know more about that, you should definitely check out my video on why narcissists constantly move goalposts. But why do they do that? They do that because they enjoy the process of making you squirm, manipulating you, intimidating you, scaring you, dragging it out. Um, and so what does moving the goalpost mean? It means that you will get some kind of an offer from them. And even if you go back and you say, I'll take exactly your offer word for word, Every single thing that you put in your offer, I accept. They'll come back with, sorry, that's no longer available. Or it's available, but I'm adding this. Or I'm taking away that. And why do they do that? They do that because it drives you crazy. Because it allows them to continue to lead you around by the nose. It's like a, a little ring in your nose that they're leading you around by. They love it. And they love seeing you squirm and they love asserting that control over you. So that's a huge red flag that you're dealing with someone who has malicious intent is constantly moving the goalposts. And if you think that what they're doing is so sick, give me a so sick in the comments. 
The second big red flag that you know that you're dealing with somebody who is malicious intent in a negotiation is you see these ultimatums like right from the beginning. I just recently had this. I was representing a woman in a divorce and her very malignant narcissistic husband was coming in to uh, negotiate. We had a mediation set up and he comes in and he starts right off with, I want my dogs back. Now, these dogs that he had, he wasn't taking care of. They were starving, and his adult daughter went and got the dogs and brought them to her house and refused to give them to him. This wasn't even anything that my client had anything to do with other than the fact that she's on better terms with the daughter than he is. And he starts off the mediation saying, I'm not doing anything today until I get my dogs back. I want the dogs, go get the dogs, go bring them to me. You know, and everybody's supposed to scatter around and do exactly what he wants. He really was trying to show the world, everybody there, that he's in charge, that this is how this is going to go. I'm in charge of the day. And, and so he picked something that was quite ridiculous and made everybody squirm about it. And here's the mediator over uh, talking to us and saying, what can you do about the dogs? And my client's on the phone with the daughter. Can you get the dogs? Can you do something with the dogs? And the daughter's like, I'm not giving up the dogs. So here we spent the first hour and a half of the mediation, not even talking about anything that has to do with the divorce. There's a very huge red flag of somebody who had malicious intent. His intent was to control. His intent was not to come to a peaceful and reasonable resolution of that case. So that's another huge red flag is that you see these ultimatums happening right away. And a third red flag that somebody has malicious intent is that they're not actually coming to the table. They're not trying to mediate it all. They just are constantly dragging out the case, more discovery, uh, sending out motions, doing all these things, but you can't get them to actually come to the table and have a conversation with you about uh, resolving the case you, or, or the issue, whatever it is. You can't, you know, what is it that you want? They don't give you an offer. They, they, they just completely avoid the entire conversation. There's another example of malicious intent. How do narcissists test their victims? Why do they test them at all? Number one, they test them because they want to make sure that you are for them. Because in a narcissist world, in, in their weird world of turmoil and, and the vortex of craziness, you're either for them or you're against them. If you are not for them, then you are the enemy. You become public enemy number one. So they're constantly checking, checking, checking to make sure that you are for them. And so you're constantly having to try to prove it, prove it, prove it all the time. And they test you in many different ways. So the reason why they do this is because they need an endless amount of what we call supply. They basically want to make sure that you are going to be there to serve what it, the whole purpose is of you being around to begin with, which is to feed their need for narcissistic supply. So narcissistic supply is anything that feeds their ego, which is you know, compliments, adulation, uh, respect, all of those things, of course. And if you don't give them those things in the form of good supply, then they'll take it. Well, they'll take it anyway in the form of what we call bad supply, which is devaluing and debasing and, and making you feel bad, judging you, putting you down, uh, little passive aggressive things to make, make it known to you that you have very little worth to them. And sometimes it's little tiny things, you know, that, that just kind of drip, drip, drip on your head where they just, it's, it's seriously death by a thousand cuts or making you crazy by just doing these little things all the time. But when they're testing you, they are just making sure 
that you're going to stick around no matter what. Even if they treat you poorly, they want to know, are you for me or against me? So they'll um, mistreat you, they'll put you down, they'll call you names, they'll give you the silent treatment. That's one of their biggest, by the way, is silent treatment. It's all a method of getting you back under their web of control. Because remember, the narcissistic relationship is love bomb to value discard. And if you want to know more about the narcissistic relationship, check out my videos on love bombing, devaluing, and discarding. And I, I go much more deeply into what a narcissistic relationship looks like. It always starts with love bomb. It always ends with discard. And I had somebody tell me it's toxic stew in between, which is definitely true. But what happens is as they're devaluing you, they can often be love bombing you. And this is all a way to keep you under their web of control. So they will be saying things to test you, you know, by devaluing you, by causing you pain, which they, they don't have the ability to feel your pain. But they're going to be doing these things just to see if you're going to stick around. So silent treatment is one big one. They will just simply, you know, um, stop talking to you because they want you to come back to them. Please talk to me. Please uh, forgive me. I am so sorry for whatever I did so that they can come back to you and, and they'll say, okay, fine. Um, they might just have a tantrum, have a full on meltdown because of the way you acted. Cause they want to see, are you going to stick around? Are you going to leave? Or are you going to be for me? Or are you going to be against me? They might even use hoovering or, or coming back, you know, even in the discard phase, they come back. And I see that often in divorces. What happens is in a divorce situation, you know, they can be acting heinous in a divorce, gaslighting you, using everything against you, using the court system against you, threatening to take your children away, threatening to that you're going to pay lots of alimony, threatening that you're not going to get any if that's what you want. You know, threat, 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 threat all over the place, lying, lying and pleadings, lying in motions, lying to lawyers, lying to the mediator, you know, manipulating evidence, all this kinds of stuff is going on. And then right in the middle of that, they say, you know, they'll send you an email. Oh, you know, why are we doing this? You know, you know that we can just get along. You know how um, it's, this isn't so good for the kids. Why are we spending this money, you know, and trying to grab you back in again, testing you, testing to see if they still have power over you, if they still have the ability to control you. For you guys who've been tested before and you think that you've been tested by a narcissist, give me a yup in the comments. Another way that narcissists test their victims is on the phone. Like, so let's say you're having a telephone conversation with them. And while you're having the conversation, you feel like, okay, we've talked about what we needed to talk about. So now I want to hang up the phone. They'll say, oh, why do you want to hang up first? Don't you want to talk to me anymore? And you know, they don't want you that that's like a form of rejection for them. Another one that's related to that is you walking away. So you're in the middle of a fight, even if they've walked away a hundred thousand times and didn't listen to you, they'll do the same thing back to you. Walk away so that, you know, you're the one groveling after them saying, please don't walk away. We can work this out. Come on back. Let's talk. And they're just testing you to see if you're going to go back after them. They're testing you to see if you are going to show them the respect that they want. And that's another way that they test you, by the way, is they'll constantly say things like, you don't respect me. You don't love me. You don't um, give me the time that I want. You're, you're always giving time to everybody else, but you're not giving time back to me. Uh, how come you're putting everybody else first? Those are all types of 
phrases to test you to see what you're going to say. Are you going to say, oh, no, no, you're first. Oh, no, I'm so sorry that I put uh, somebody else in front of you. Of course, you mean the most to me. Yes, I love you. Of course, I love you. Here's all the ways that I love you. So, you know, making sure that you're still there, you're still the one. I mean, they might even make you do something for them just to see if you're going to do it because they're testing you. They want to make sure that you're for them. They have to constantly have reassurance that you're for them. So the truth is they're testing you from the beginning of the relationship. A lot of times what you see with narcissists is they move in super quickly. You know, the the relationship is super fast tracked in the love bomb stage. So, you know, let's meet your kids right away. I want to move if you have children from a previous relationship, or I want to move right into your home right away. And, and, and they're testing to see if you are the right type of supply for them by how you respond to that. Because, you know, do you let them move in right away? Do you say, I love you right away? Do you immediately agree that you're supposed to be soulmates and yes, you're meant to be together. And how crazy is it that you just met and you're soulmates and you're meant to be together? You know, that kind of thing. So the bottom line is that narcissists are testing you from the minute you walk into their lives until the minute that you go no contact and and actually stop talking to them because they always want to know, can you be a form of supply for them? And if you're not, then you are the enemy and they're going to go after you, smear you, try to take you down as much as possible. All right. So early red flags of narcissists early, early, early before they even come near you. I want to make sure that you get like this cone of safety, cone of safety around you, right? So maybe you've been in a relationship with a narcissist. Maybe you're trying to get out of one right now. And if that's you, if you're trying to get out of one right now, I have, by the way, I have a free ebook that you got to get. It's free crush my negotiation prep worksheet that you got to get. You just go to crushmydeal.com, free ebook. You can just get that. Just go ahead and grab that. I've had many people win their entire negotiations on it. Just go to crushmydeal.com and get that. But if you are even thinking that you might be in a relationship, these are the early signs. I'm going to give you six of them and you're going to want to stay all the way to the end and see what all six of them are. All right. So number one is it's a really, really fast moving relationship, really fast moving. You know, they're, they're like right away. It's overwhelming fast. You know, they got to get to it, get to it, get to it. And you're almost overwhelmed at how quickly they're moving along this relationship. And, and, you know, you don't have a chance to catch your breath. That's how it it is. By the way, this is business or personal. I was in a business relationship with a narcissist and I felt this too in the business relationship. It, It moves very, very quickly. So that's number one. Number two, the second big major red flag of a narcissist is that they'll say things like your soulmates, things like that. You know, they'll start saying things that will make you feel like, wow, where has this person been all of my life right away? I mean, they might even say that on the first date or maybe even before the first date, they'll say things like that. So that's number two early red flag that you are in a relationship with a narcissist. Number three, number three, they will say things like their ex is just crazy. They'll start right away with how horrible their ex is and how awful it was with their ex. I mean, they might even say how horrible their ex is with their kids that they're alienating them with their kids. And it was just an awful traumatic situation with their ex. 
that's another massive early red flag that you are in a relationship with a narcissist. If you are with a with a person that has a great relationship with their ex, that's a good sign. That's actually a good sign, okay? Conversely, the number four early red flag that you are in a relationship with a narcissist is that they love everything that you love. What narcissists do is they study you. They actually study you and they start mirroring you. They actually be kind of become you. They start figuring out what it is that you like. And now all of the sudden, they almost want to align with everything that you love so that you almost sort of fall in love with yourself in a way. They're very, very good at reading people. They've been doing this for years. I don't know if many of you have read the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, where he talked about it took 10,000 hours to achieve mastery. Well, this is way more than 10,000 hours. These are people who have taken years and years and years to achieve mastery and manipulation since they were children. It's a survival mechanism. And so what they have done is actually studied people since they were children. And, and what they needed to do was to survive, was look to see what they needed to do to become that person, to become likable. And so they really almost become that person just, just to get in with them, just to become assimilated, just to get to that next level of commitment. They love everything that you love initially. And I have a whole series of videos on this love bombing and then they go into devaluing and then the discard phase. And you can check out my videos on the three different levels of a narcissistic relationship yourself, if you would like. And now after all of this, your, your eyes will be wide open. So I want you to put that in the comments right now. Eyes wide open, because that's where you'll be from now on, eyes wide open. So that's number four. Number five, number five early red sign of narcissism is they'll tell you a sob story, sob story to get you to feel sorry for them. You know, maybe they had a horrible childhood. Life hasn't been fair to them. They'll tell you all about how awful things have been for them so that you start to feel sorry for them. Maybe their parents weren't good to them or something happened to them because they want you to start to empathize for them, have compassion for them, take care of them, start giving them that narcissistic supply that they're seeking. They're going to look to see if you are going to be a good source of narcissistic supply for them. That's what they're going to be looking for. All right. So they're drawing you in bringing you in to see and starting to test you to see if you are going to be a good source of value, a good source of supply for them. Another early red flag of narcissism, telling you a sob story. All right, that's number five. And number six, the last one is your gut. Trust your gut. You're going to know, you're going to feel like something is off. You're just going to feel it because it's going to be rushed along. They're going to be moving you along. You're going to be feeling like, oh man, put the brakes on. Something is happening. It's going way too fast. And even when you start to go, you know what? Maybe this is moving too fast. I, I don't know about this. They're going to be going, oh no, this is not moving too fast. We are soulmates. This was meant to be. They're going to be, every time you start to have concerns, they're going to have an answer for you. They're going to be right there, not even giving you that chance to breathe, not giving you that chance to think, because they're going to be right there in your face with the emails, flooding your inbox, showing up wherever, all the time, 
and they're going to know exactly what to say. Be perfect at every moment until they lock you in. If you were in a relationship with a narcissist, the way you got into that relationship with that narcissist, the way it all began, this whole thing all began with love bombing because that's where narcissists start. They start off with love bombing. So remember that narcissists are the, the, the most shallow people you could possibly ever meet. They have no inner sense of value. All of their value has to be derived from the external. And how they do that is through what we call narcissistic supply. That's their lifeblood, that's their food, that's their oxygen. It's narcissistic supply. So supply can be in the form of money, prestige, compliments, but it also comes in the form of control, coercive control, psychological abuse, um, victimization, and just going after people in a way that they get them under their layer of control because by asserting control over people and exerting that control over people, they feel better about themselves. They feel like they are controlling the world around them and getting everybody to see that they're so amazing and so wonderful because if they see that side of them, then they'll never see what's really going on underneath, which is that they are the most scared little people, the most fragile egos on the planet. That's actually the secret. The secret is that you're stronger than they are by a lot. And they don't want you to know that though. So, but how it all begins, how the whole fairy tale begins is through what we call love bombing. And then they, they graduate into starting with the discarding and the devaluing, well, just devaluing, then discarding. But really these three stages of a narcissistic relationship happen all at once in a lot of ways. It's not linear. It's not like they go from love bombing, stop, discarding, stop, and then or sorry, devaluing, stop, and then discarding, stop. It doesn't happen that way. It's actually much more mixed together that way. They can actually be discarding you and love bombing you at the same time. And sometimes that's called hoovering, but that's what they do. They, they use love bombing as a method, as a strategy to manipulate you. So remember that narcissists are master manipulator, master manipulators. You know that whole thing about 10,000 hours to become experts at something? Well, they've spent their entire lifetimes. They have way more than 10,000 hours in learning how to manipulate you. So the, the manipulation starts in the love bombing phase. So in the love bombing phase, this is where you're gonna start to see that they're gonna overwhelm the person, overwhelm them with how perfect they are. So in a business setting, this love bombing might take place in the form or, or, or manifest itself in the form of, you know, being the perfect business partner, you know, but th this person can get you the deals that you want, introduce you to the clients that you want, has the skill set that you want, open the doors that you want to open. Everything about them just seems absolutely amazing. Okay. In a romantic setting, they just absolutely, they come on super strong. A, a really great example of this is the Dirty John series. And if any of you haven't seen that, you should check it out. It's a mini series actually on Netflix. It's actually also um, a podcast, which was super, super uh, popular. But the guy in that went after this woman who was a very successful woman in her 50s who had had you know, lots of success as a professional. She also had beautiful children that she had a wonderful relationship with and a close family. But the one thing that was missing in her life was this perfect romantic partner. So this guy comes along and sets himself up to be as absolutely perfect for her as possible. And so what did he do for her? He did everything a busy professional woman who's on her own would love to have. He was taking care of her dry cleaning and cooking her dinner and making her smoothies in the morning and 
taking her on trips and just becoming like the most perfect person ever. And so that's what they do. But what they do is they move super fast. So the relationship is on this fast track. You know, they, right away, within weeks, they're talking about marriage or moving in together or, or, or um, you know, what the future is gonna be forever. And they insist right away on meeting your children if you have children from another relationship or meeting your family or meeting your friends. They wanna be fully moved in and fully in, in control of you as fast as possible before you have a chance to figure out who this person really is. Because once they've got you under that layer of control, that's when they can start to take over and start to actually move into more of the devalue phase. What you'll see in this phase is like massive amounts of compliments and, and lavishing you with gifts and bombarding you with text messages and phone calls. And you'll start to see, you'll start to see where they want to know everything about you. They want to know where you are at all times and how come you didn't call them back right away? And um, who are you talking to? You know, right away you start to see, you start to see these little signs of things that aren't necessarily right. Um, you know, in the Dirty John movie, the, the man actually um, laid down on the woman's bed you know, in her bedroom after their first date and almost refused to leave, you know, and she saw that as a red flag, but she kind of ended up ignoring it because of all these other things. I mean, they just overwhelm you with love bombing. As part of this, they want that commitment right away. They want to see right away that you're, you know, not seeing anybody else, that you are giving them the, your undivided attention. Right away, early on, you're going to start to see where there's going to be some jealousy that you're giving attention to other people. Well, if you really love me, if we were soulmates, that so you would just give me all of your attention. And so you start to feel guilty if you're giving attention to somebody else, but you're, you're really feeling like, well, but this person really needs me. They're, they're, they're extremely needy. And they may even present themselves to you as partially victimized, like they just need you so much because of this, they, you know, they had a terrible family or maybe their ex-spouse treated them awfully or maybe, you know, the, their kids were alienated from them. So they just really, really need you and they need you now and they need all of your attention right away. So these are the kinds of things that you see in the love bombing phase and you do see these red flags start to crop up where they start to like right away in your space and right away jealous that you're doing other things, right away demanding to know everything that you're up to, right away wanting to start controlling aspects of your life, right away maybe actually even distancing you from your friends or your family or your loved ones because you know, you should be spending time with, with each other and, and that person is just jealous of the time that we're spending together and jealous that you finally found somebody that's perfect for you, jealous that you finally found a soulmate. So that, that's the kind of thing that you'll see, but they, they couch it in these terms that make it seem like it's okay that they're moving in so quickly because you're soulmates and you're meant to be together. We're gonna to talk today about that second stage, devaluing, and what it looks like, the many different types of devaluing, and what you can do about it. After they've love bombed you and got you all ensconced in, into their web, their web of control, like a, a, a tarantula gets you into their web, then they start to suck the blood out of you. And they do that, they start that with the devaluing phase. So remember that narcissists have no inner sense of value. They have to suck all their value from the external and they do that by attaching themselves to people that they can suck supply from. They are predators and they're not gonna attach themselves to you unless you've got something good that they can suck from, something that they want. So it might be your adulation, it might be that you can um, you know, bring them to places they want to be brought to, introduce them to people they want to be introduced to, make them look good in some way, bolster up their ego in some way, 
and and they may want to bolster their ego by making you look bad or devaluing you that's a lot of times how it looks remember it's a method of control so the first way that they devalue you is through a method called gaslighting it's a very highly manipulative technique of psychological abuse where they try to make you think that you're crazy the word actually came from a play which was also then made into a movie the play was from 1938 and what the husband in the movie would do to try to make his wife think that he was crazy or she was crazy is he would dim the gas lights or he would actually blow them out and she would say wasn't that just lit and he would say no no it wasn't and and so he was trying to make her think that she was crazy and so that's where the word gaslighting comes from so what gaslighting will look like is you'll say um Oh, I didn't know that you were doing that. And the other person, the narcissist, will say, Oh, yes, you did. We talked about that. Don't you remember? You agreed. And, and you start to actually question your own sanity. Like, oh, did we talk about that? Oh, I don't think we did. But you know that you didn't. But, you know, it, it, when they do that over and over again, this gaslighting technique, it actually starts to work on you psychologically. And your brain becomes scrambled. So that's number one is gaslighting. Number two is emotional appeals. So they, they try to play on your emotions, like get you to feel sorry for them. Oh, you're attacking me and I have so much work to do or I have so much stress and I can't deal with this right now. Or I don't like the way you said that. You know, you're questioning something about them and, and they push it back on you like, oh, you're really hurting me, or that was below the belt, or I don't like the way you said that, or I didn't like the language that you used. So it deflects away from your own messaging. Another way that they will devalue you is through this burden of proof. Like, uh, prove it, prove that I'm wrong, prove that I did that, prove that I'm lying. If, if, if you can't prove it, then it's not true or it, it is true or whatever if you can't prove it then whatever you're saying has no value no merit whatsoever another way of devaluing is labeling you or calling you names like saying that you're stupid or you're moronic i mean those are just outwardly devaluing you another way of devaluing is to ridicule you you know like make fun of you make fun of the way you talk make fun of the way you you know walk Make fun of the way you cook. Make fun of the way you do anything. You know, just devaluing. And they might say, oh, you can't take a joke. Come on, take a joke. Or they'll say something that's really mean and then they'll say, ha, huh, at the end of it. Like, oh, it was just meant to be funny. But you know that it was meant to hurt you. Another way of devaluing you is to ignore you or not pay attention to what you're saying. You know, so you're telling them about something that really means a lot to you. And halfway through the sentence, they're just talking about something else, looking at something else, picking up your phone, um, you know, or they might just kind of give you a, a quick little response and then, you know, be on to what are we having for dinner, just really just subtly letting you know that they really don't care about what it is that you were talking about. Another way of devaluing is what we call triangulation or lining up fl uh, flying monkeys. And that is to get everybody, you know, that they can on their side, letting you know, it's a message to you that all of these people are siding with this other person, siding with this other person against you, or that they just think this person is so incredible. So you better not come out and say anything against this person, or you're just going to look like the crazy one. You're just going to look like there's something wrong with you because everybody else thinks they're in amazing. Another way of devaluing is broken or empty promises. So they'll tell you that they're going to do something. They'll tell you they're never going to do it again, or that they're going to work on this part of the relationship. And maybe you see them do it for a day or two or even a week or two, and then it goes back to where it was before. So they're just letting you know in a subtle way that whatever it was that they promised you, they're just not going to do. They don't care enough about you to actually continue to, um, to do those things or to do them at all. And if you've seen any of these behaviors and it's sounding super familiar to you, give me a totally in the comments. Another way of devaluing you is 
incredulity, meaning just being incredulous, incredulous, not believing. Like, oh my God, you actually believe that? Or you actually believe what that person is saying? You're actually going along with that? I can't believe you're doing that. How stupid are you for believing in that? You know, and, and they may even, you know, have that if you decide that you want to have a certain religion or maybe you think a certain person is really terrific, they're going to, you know, cut that down. And that serves a number of purposes for them when they do that, by the way, because it can mean like, okay, whatever you think is stupid because obviously you're thinking something is great. But the other part of that is that they can't stand when you think something is so fantastic because it might compete with them. It might compete for your attention for them. So they definitely are going to have to devalue anything else that might take your attention away from them, whether it's a person, whether it's an activity or you know a belief, whatever it is. But if it takes away from your full attention on them and your full adulation on them, then it's something that they're definitely going to devalue. Another way of devaluing is like passive aggression. So how this might look in a divorce setting is that the person might say, that they are going to put money in a certain bank account. So, you know, it, it, well, they might say, I'll take care of paying the bills. I told you I would take care of it because you said, please put the money in the bank account. And so they say, oh, we'll take care of it. So, you know, for days go on, days go on that you're looking in the bank account, no money, no money, no money. So you go back to the person and you say, hey, you said that you were going to put the money in the bank account. You still haven't done that. I need to pay the bills. And the person comes back to you and they say, um, no, what I said was I would take care of it. I meant I will pay the bill. So they change the, 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 what, what you, and they knew what you actually believed, but they just wanted to mess with you. So then you say, okay, are you going to pay the bills directly? Yes, I, I, I'll take care of it. And then days go by and they haven't actually paid the bills directly either. And then you have to go back to them again. And it's all a way of devaluing you, making you feel less, taking something that's important to you. And anytime they can find an area of vulnerability, they will use that against you. And so, and, and, and find a way to devalue that. So anything that you think is important, that's going to get devalued. Anything that you think that is, um, that matters to you, that is going to end up being devalued. And it can even happen in your sex life. And if you haven't checked out my videos, I have a three-part series on narcissism and sex. You should definitely check that out because it even happens in the bedroom as well. These are just a few of the ways that narcissists devalue you. So it's love bomb devalue, then discard. And as I said, they kind of all happen at the same time. But in part three, I'm gonna talk much more about the discard phase. So this is part three of a three-part series on the relationship with a narcissist and the phases of a relationship with a narcissist. So the three phases of, of a relationship with a narcissist are the love bombing phase, and you're gonna to wanna to go check out that video, and then the devalue phase. Today, we're going to be talking about the discard phase. And the discard phase is where you're kind of ending this relationship with a narcissist. And it could be that you're ending it or they're ending it. So just remember that the three phases of a narcissistic relationship don't happen in linear format. And it's not a timeline. It's not like, okay, now we're in the love bomb phase. Oh, done. Now we're in the discard phase. Oop, or now we're in the devalue phase. Oop, done. Now we're in the discard phase. It's, it's, they kind of are all happening at the same time. And you can be, you know, being discarded while you're being devalued and love bomb while you're being devalued and on and on like that. And so, it's really important to understand that yes, they basically happen in linear fashion. You always start with the love bomb. You always end with the discard, 
but in between there, they're kind of all mixed together and it's kind of a Venn diagram that overlaps with each other. So they start off with the love bombing, this overwhelming, I'm perfect for you, and whatever they need to do to get you into their layer of control. It's all about control because narcissists inside have no sense of inner value. They have to derive all of their value from the external. And as I've said in many of my videos, they're like that hollow chocolate Easter bunny. They have no sense of internal value. They have no empathy, no care for other people. They really just have one thing that they want all the time. And that is narcissistic supply. And they need an endless amount of supply. You're basically feeding a beast, feeding a black hole. It never ends, never ends, never ends. And where do they get that supply? They get that, that supply from the people around them. So they literally are sucking supply from people. And that's why sometimes they're called energy vampires. Or sometimes they're called parasites or leeches because they literally leave their supply source feeling completely drained. They're draining the life out of you. They're like vampires that are sucking blood from you, sucking the life force out of you. And how do they do that? Through this narcissistic supply. They need an endless amount of supply. So the whole reason they love bomb you in the first place, the whole reason you were even targeted in the first place is for their oxygen source, which is really that supply. So they've love bombed you, they've devalued you, all, in a, all to get control over you. It's all about getting that control over you. Um, and now you're into the, the discard phase. And the discard phase can be you deciding you don't want to be with this person anymore, or it may be that they don't want to have a relationship with you anymore. But regardless of how it takes place, it's going to be your fault. And they have to make it look like your fault because they want to look good to the rest of the world. And when you're dealing with a narcissist, the one thing you've got to remember is that you're either for them or you're against them. You're either in their world and, and providing adulation and supply and value to them, or if you no longer have value to them, then you no longer have value, period. In fact, you become a liability. And so now you're the enemy. You become public enemy number one. And so they're gonna go after you with all guns blazing to make sure that the world knows that it was your fault, your problem, you're the one that's bad. And sometimes they can be setting up this discard phase even before the actual end of your relationship. So, you know, it's in the discard phase that you start to see the birth of this smear campaign. So it, what it might look like is that you know, they might three months or six months before a divorce is filed, start to slip little things into friends or neighbors like, oh, I'm so worried about her. I'm so worried about him. You know, they, they're just drinking so much more than they used to. I'm really concerned. You know, and they'll couch it like that so that when the divorce is actually filed or the breakup actually takes place, they can go back and go, well, I told you that this was happening. You know, so it's very, very insidious. It's very toxic and um, very stealth, very under the radar. They're super good at being master manipulators. So, you know, the smear campaign can start even before you even realize that there's an impending end to the relationship. So what happens at the end of a relationship sometimes is what we call hoovering which is where they kind of come back and start to love bomb you again. And, um, you know, it's like during the discard phase, because even if you wanted to to the end of the relationship or they did or whatever, they may come back and love bomb you again because they either want to get control back over you just so that they can get the settlement that they want in your case, or maybe they just want to get you away from their lawyer or, you know, or maybe they just really can't stand the fact that you're moving on. Even if they wanted to discard you, maybe they get upset because you're moving on so fast. 
or that you're with somebody else now already. So then they come running back to try to love bomb you again to get you back under their layer of control. It's very insidious and sick. They've already messed with your brain. So you've already probably got some kind of trauma bonding going on. Meaning what happens is, is if they love bomb to value, love bomb to value, love bomb to value, love bomb discard, love bomb discard, your brain actually releases dopamine levels that cause you to anticipate that you might get this love bomb. So it, it's not the actual um, love bombing, it's the anticipation that you might get it. And so your brain actually becomes addicted to this person. And love bombing and devaluing and discarding is how they cause you to become actually addicted to being with you and wanting to believe everything they say when they give you empty promises that things are gonna be different or that they're going to change in some way or whatever it is. So you have to be really, really aware of that and really careful of that. And the only way that you can really protect yourself going forward is to just completely go no contact. And sometimes it's not possible because you have children together or whatever, but if that's, if you do have children or you, the, maybe the person's a member of your family, then you just have to have the strongest, most steel boundaries that you possibly can so that you can protect yourself from this toxicity. The one thing you need to remember, and it's hard to remember and sometimes very hard to accept, is that this person is not going to change. They cannot re be rehabilitated. It's like if an, a limb was cut off and, and you know you can't put a new one on there. I mean, it's not gonna grow. I mean, you could, you could get a fake one or whatever, but it, it, there's not gonna be a new one that grows. And it's just the same thing. They can't grow empathy. They can't grow care. They, 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 can, they can fake it. I mean, they certainly know how they're supposed to behave, but it doesn't mean they actually feel it. There's just something broken inside of their brains that doesn't allow them to feel it. So it's better for you if you just understand this in this discard phase and, and move on. Now, if you are dealing with a narcissist, then that narcissist is probably driving you crazy or actually maybe even feeling like insane. And you're thinking, is there any way to make them panic? Yes, there is. But first, let me just go through a couple of the things that they do to you, because it's important to understand that so that you can understand the flip side of it and what makes them panic. So a couple of their go-to things are things like gaslighting. Gaslighting is trying to make you think that you're crazy. And what they do is they'll say, oh, we talked about that, or don't you remember that, or no, that's not how that went. Um, something like that and shifting, shifting what they said, shifting what you guys talked about, shifting what you know you said so that it meets their agenda, which is to manipulate you and to make you think that you're crazy. So gaslighting is definitely one of their favorite, favorite, favorite tactics. Another one of their favorite tactics is lying. They are total pathological liars. The crazy thing I think about narcissists is that they'll lie about stuff that they don't even need to lie about. You know, you think to, the, to yourself, why are you lying about that? You don't even need to lie about that. But the thing is that narcissists think that they need to manipulate everything. They, they don't believe that they can get anything just on a nor in a normal way. They feel like they have to, to lie. So they will lie about even things that are readily verifiable, which is the thing that's pretty crazy. And in a lot of my other videos, I talk about making sure that you document, document, document everything that you do, because they will eventually contradict themselves. They will eventually put things in writing that are completely contradictory to what is actually happening or what they've said before. Now they'll have some explanation for it, but that doesn't mean that you won't eventually be able to use it against them. Okay, so number two thing that they do on a very regular basis is lie. The third thing they try to do a lot of is intimidation tactics. So what, they, what, that, what I mean by that is, is that they will 
constantly try to make you be afraid. So they intimidate you in all sorts of ways. They're, you're afraid that they're going to hurt you. They're afraid they're going to expose you. They're, you're afraid that they're gonna take your kids. They're very, very, very good at figuring out what your weaknesses are, what, what means the most to you, and that's what they'll go for. So if you're a mother and you don't want to lose your kids, they'll say, I'm taking the kids and you'll never see your kids again. Um, if you are dependent upon this person for support, they'll say, uh, I'm going to take everything and leave you in the street. Um, if, uh, if you want money from this person, then, then, you know, then they'll use that against you. So whatever they can use against you, they will, and they'll scare you into thinking like, oh my God, my life is going to be so terrible if I cross this person. And there's all different types of, of intimidation tactics that they use. Some are more violent than others. Uh, if they're more of a malignant type of narcissist, some of them are a little bit more stealth if they're like a covert narcissist. But, you know, all narcissists use the same kinds of tactics. Uh, for the most part, gaslighting is definitely one. Lying is definitely one as well. And intimidating you in some ways is one as well. And another thing that they often try to do is triangulate. This is where they get their flying monkeys involved and they get you to believe that all these other people have lined up a, a side by side with them, supporting them. And if you cross this person or you come out and try to expose them in some way, then you're going to want be the one that looks crazy and you're going to be the one that looks insane or you'll lose all your friends because everybody believes that this person is absolutely wonderful. And so obviously you're the one that must be insane. So the, the, the term flying monkeys comes back from the Wizard of Oz and it was when the Wicked Witch had her flying monkeys in, uh, on her side. And that's what narcissists do. They all do it. They all try to make you think that they're like so close to all these other people. And so therefore you shouldn't come out and try to say anything bad about this person because everybody else thinks this person is amazing. These are just a few of the things that they do. If this is all sounding all too familiar to you, go ahead and give me a totally in the comments. And if you are dealing with these things with the narcissist, which I'm sure you are, make sure you check out my video on self-care when coping with a narcissist. I will drop a link to that below. You want to make sure that you're taking care of, of yourself when you're dealing with a narcissist. I'm sure all these things sound really familiar to you, but in the end, okay, great. What can you do about it? So here's the not so secret secret about narcissists. That is that they are actually the most scaredy cats on the planet. They have no sense of inner value. I've often said they're like the chocolate Easter bunnies that are hollow inside. They have no sense of internal value whatsoever. So they've got to go and get all of their sense of, of value from the external. And that's what we call narcissist supply. It's in the form of compliments, money, prestige, you know, whatever it is that they can get to get attention for themselves on the external. But the thing is, they're super afraid. So they, if you push back on them enough, they will back down. So what causes a narcissist to panic, to feel stunned. Number one, brutal honesty. They expect, because they're pathological liars, that most people lie too. They really just expect that everybody else is just as bad as they are. They don't understand what it's like to be a normal person. They, they've never been one, so they don't get that. They don't get that people out there actually have integrity. They understand the concept of it, but they just really don't believe that anybody else has it. So if you're just brutally honest with them, it kind of stuns them and they're not exactly sure what to do with that. So for example, like if they, you know, a covert narcissist is all often sick. That's one of the things that they do. They have this whole shtick that they're, they're unwell in some way, they can't work or whatever it is. Um, you know, there's always some reason to feel sorry for the covert narcissist. 
And so, you know, if one day they're super sick and then the next day they show up at something fun, something that they want to actually be involved in, because of course they don't want to miss out on getting attention for themselves, you know, just without any kind of sarcasm or attitude or whatever, just say, oh, I'm so surprised that you're here. You know, you, you said you were so sick yesterday. And you, you have to be careful because if you say with any kind of tone whatsoever, they're like super sensitive. They can, you know, they, they can sense it no matter what level of, of, of sarcasm it is. They'll feel it. They'll sense it. Even if it's not there, they'll, they might think it's there. So just make sure you're really saying it like as if you're reporting the news. I always say like just the facts, ma'am, right? Just, oh, I'm, so, I'm surprised you're here. You, you said you were so sick yesterday. They won't know what to do with that. So um, brutal honesty is number one. Okay, number two is pushing back. This is something that they don't expect, especially if you are used to giving in and acquiescing to whatever it is that they want. They will be really surprised and it will make them panic if you push back against them. If they start to realize this person they thought they had total control over is no longer listening to everything that they do or doing everything that they say or buying into everything that they're selling, it will stun them and it will start to panic them a little bit because they'll be going, what's going on here? Why is this person pushing back against me? Something like that. Okay. So that's number two. Okay, and number three is exposing them. They do not want to be exposed for any reason whatsoever. If you really want to throw a narcissist into panic mode, let them think that they're going to be exposed or actually expose them. If their flying monkeys find out who they really are, or if somebody that they respect gets to see something, side of them that they don't want seen, then that's a really huge way to make a, uh, a narcissist panic. So for example, in a mediation situation, if um, you know something about the narcissist that they don't want the other side to know, you know, you might subtly say like that, that, that fact is going to come out. In, in my world, it could be that the person has a sexually transmitted disease and they are a doctor in the community. They probably don't want the world to know that. So especially if they got it by cheating on you and everything else. So sometimes, you know, not uh, going to court can be a huge motivator for a narcissist. It can really make them panic if they think that, you know, the world is gonna see things about them that they are have taken painstaking efforts to hide and make sure nobody else knows. So number three is exposing them. Okay, and number four is losing control in any way. So remember what we talked about, that they're the most scared people on the planet. They're really like the bullies, you know? Um, you know how uh, in, in A Christmas Story, that old movie, that you know the, the little boy fought back against the bully and then the bully ended up running away you know you're really just figuring out what their level is and and they're doing the same thing to you by the way so every time you uh push back a little bit against them they'll act up even more they'll they'll uh, do more of their lying more of their control tactics more of their intimidation more of their narcissistic rage it will spurn them because they'll think, okay, I just need to clamp down a little bit harder against this person so that they'll behave and get back under my layer of control. Or they might start love bombing again and then devaluing, love bomb, devalue. They'll start you know, doing this campaign of love bombing again because they're trying to get you back into their layer of control. They're panicking. So losing control is something that really sends them into a tizzy. The reason they do all the things that they do, gaslighting, manipulation, uh, lying, all the things that I talked about at the beginning of this video is because they're trying to assert control over you because they are so insecure underneath. And the way that you can make them panic is by having them lose some of that control. And, you know, just like if you have a two-year-old that has a tantrum 
they're conditioning the parents. It's like, okay, if I scream loud enough, if I have enough of a tantrum here, if I cry loud enough, then mommy and daddy will give me what I want. And if you give in it, it, as a parent to that child, then they'll know next time, I just need to scream louder, I just need to scream longer, and eventually they'll give in to what I want. So what the narcissist is doing is trying to figure out at what level do I need to act at to get this person back into my layer of control. And if you, you know, uh, give into that, then they know I just need to be that much louder, that much uh, off, more awful next time in order to get this person to come back to my layer of control. So if you really want to make a narcissist panic, let them realize that you're no longer buying in to that stuff. When they start losing control, that's when they super panic.